I'd like to um, approve the minutes of September 19th. Move to approve. Second. Well, I'd Aye. like to comment. Yes. Actually, maybe two, two sure. small comments. Sure. Um, <coughs> first page, second full paragraph, Council Freeman James. Mm -hmm. Wasn't, weren't we talking about the family literacy program, not just the literacy program? Uh, adult literacy. It's called the, the, I thought they called it the family literacy. No. No. Oh, okay. Yeah, adult literacy. Um, and then on page three. Mm -hmm. Third to the last paragraph, Peg Keller was present. That last sentence, the criteria at the state level focuses on severe health and safety, not housing maintenance. Was, wasn't that what we were talking about? Well, health and safety issues, they'll do repair work for it. So right. not just like ongoing house. house. Now, is that, I mean, it, it could be right. Are you, are, are you other members? Sentence, or do you want to, to clarify a little bit? No, it's fine. It's fine. You, you could be right. It could have been maintenance. Um, I think, didn't she talk about housing? She did. Remember, she talked about housing. Yeah, she talk about housing. Yeah, now, CPA funds. Right, that's, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. I remember her saying that the CPA funds, due to some lawsuits, have been clarified how exactly they would be, uh, how exactly they would use them. You know what I'll find out? Um, so if it'd be all right. If the other counselor, if you other will ask. are comfortable with this tonight. Yeah. I'm comfortable. Yeah. Then I drop mine. Okay. We'll, uh. So, all Aye. Aye. Um, I just want to introduce um, our new counselor on um, social services and veterans affairs. This is his second meeting with us, Owen Daniel Spreeman from Ward 3. Okay, at 5 o'clock we have an update on Parent Social Norms Project and General Coalition Update. And Karen Jarvis Vance is not here and Marissa is here and we have Glenn Johnson. So, Glenn, why right. don't you come up okay. and... If you want to, we can bring a couple of chairs right up here and you can speak. Oh, okay. Or up there, depends on what you want to do. Well, here, from here I can look at the PowerPoint, oh, okay. which sort of helps me, so maybe I'll do that. <laughs> um, so I'm Glenn Johnson, I'm the coordinator of the Northampton Prevention Coalition. Marisa Hebel is here as well, she works with us. She's an employee of Spiffy Coalition over at the Educational Collaborative, but she uh, uh, contracts with us for about 10 hours a week to work on our social norms projects. And Marilyn Richards is here as well, she's the co-chair of our coalition. Next slide. Um, so our mission is to collaboratively initiate, coordinate, and sustain prevention and intervention efforts that reduce youth substance use and abuse within the city of Northampton. Next slide. We represent all um, sectors of the community, parents, youth, business, healthcare, youth serving organizations, media, et cetera. Um, we have lots of, we have memorandums of understanding with partners from all these different sectors that will collaborate together on these projects. The participation of each of these sectors varies. We're right now especially trying to beef up our involvement from youth and business and parents. Next slide. Um, I thought it might be good just to remind ourselves why are we doing this work. It's sort of, uh, you know, it seems like a no-brainer that, of course, we try to reduce youth substance use, but there are some reasons why this is a particularly key issue. Um, one of the two that I'll present, one is just that 9 out of 10 Americans who meet the medical criteria for addiction started smoking, drinking, or using other drugs before age 18. So getting an early start sort of tends to set people up for a lifetime of addiction. And if we can try to reduce the number of people who are using before age 18, we can impact the number of people who are using throughout their lives. Next slide. There's also increasing evidence that using uh, drugs and alcohol be, uh, in the in before age, well, that the brain continues to develop into the mid-20s and that, um, in particular, what's being developed are that sort of uh, the capacity for logical problem solving, long-range thinking, all that kind of uh, adult-oriented thinking that 
we do so much of it in our daily lives and sort of take for granted is actually a, you know, a capacity of the brain which is still developing up to age in, into the mid-20s and that alcohol and drugs can, can uh, cause damage during that period when it's under construction and can uh, create problems <clears throat> on, on an ongoing basis, sort of creating neural pathways for addiction and, and substance use that cause lots of trouble for, uh, for, for us in our community later in life. Next slide. So our work to reduce youth substance use sort of falls into two general categories. One is the actual activities that we do to prevent youth substance use. That's sort of the fun stuff. I put it later in the, in the, in the, um, in the slideshow. But we also do work just to build up the coalition and try to increase the, uh, the collaboration and the capacity and the funding and the resources we have to prevent youth substance use. Next slide. So one thing we've done since I came on board at the end of January is uh, begin to establish a coalition structure. We have a steering committee that meets, that sort of guides and does the long range planning for the coalition. We have full coalition meetings, which are basically open to anyone who wants to be involved. And then we have work groups that are currently also taking place at those full coalition meetings. One working to engage parents and the other trying to reduce youth access to substances. Next slide. Could oh, I just question? ask sure. you? Absolutely. Um, can you go back, please? On the engaging parents. Yes. Now, like, all right. Say that you do have a youth who does have a drug problem. Mm -hmm. And so, what do you do? You have the steering committee and the full coalition, and then the engaging parents. Do the parents? Are they involved with? Like steering committee and so forth like that, or is it just a separate group? Okay, so parents? Um, there is a group that's part of our coalition that works to engage parents in our effort. And that falls into sort of two categories. One is, um, uh, you'll see a presentation from Marisa late, later about how we try to get um, parents to um, we got, try and get parents to sort of have healthier policies and behaviors around youth substance use to, that they can play an enormous role in reducing youth use. The other thing is just having parents involved in our coalition so that we're having that feedback while we do all the work that we do. Uh, parents whose children are, 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 are using substances or have developed an addiction uh, usually would get a referral from their provider to other resources and supports. That isn't something our coalition has so far taken on as a key issue of concern. Yeah. In, uh, the addressing access, I didn't know we could ask questions in the middle of this. Go <laughs> addressing ahead. Addressing access. <laughs> yes. Uh, what are you doing addressing the access? Um, well, one, actually, that one I will put off to later just because later in the, in the um, presentation, I have some specific examples of some of our activities, and we can take more. We can talk more about it after the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on this one? No. All right. Next slide. So one of the things we do to build the coalition is sort of trying to train people, educate them, give them the resources and skills they need, so we can be effective. Um, we uh, went. We participated in three weeks of classroom training at a, a national coalition academy sponsored by the Coalition Anti-Drug Co Coalitions of America. One week in April, one week in June, one week in August. I went to each week, and uh, Gail Gramarosa, Caroline Boyles, and Karen Jarvis Vance each came with me for one of those weeks uh, in Fort Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, and um, they gave us a very comprehensive training on coalition building, and there was distance learning involved as well. So. We're learning all the ins and outs of strategic planning, fun sustainability planning, you know, tracking your, your events in the media, and so on. Next slide. We also have stuff to do like making business cards and, and uh, websites and so on. And so we needed a first step, we needed a logo. We wanted to really involve youth in this, but we wanted to also make sure that it wasn't just the winner gets their logo printed on everything. We wanted to give that youth an opportunity to really develop their skills around logo design. So, so our winner was Bryce Wall, who's an eighth grader from JFK. 
And um, he worked with a graphic designer, Lynn Rudier, over, um, over a, a number of meetings to sort of hone in, in the image and get feedback from our group so that it could get improved. And the, the final result is right there. And he won an iPad, which was um, donated by Smith College and Yes Computers. Next slide. Um, we also do advocacy, and I guess this is coming to you as part of it, educating our decision makers about the issues that we're taking on and the work that we're doing. Um, in February, I went to the um, CADCA uh, uh, conference, and while there, a group of us from Western Mass went and spoke to aides from Senator Brown's office, from Senator Oliver's office, et cetera, uh, Congressman Oliver's office, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. And the work of building the coalition continues. We have um, bylaws to create, a website to create, orientations to create, and more. Um, next slide. We also want to start thinking now about how to sustain our work. Uh, currently, we have $125,000 a year in funding for five years from the Drug-Free Communities, a grant of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And part of that was we had to buy $125,000 in match as well. So people donating their time, uh, organizations donating their space, uh, et cetera, sort of all added up to $125,000 in in-kind support. Next slide. But our goal is to try to have a much more diverse funding structure so that if this grant went away, uh, we could continue our work. So. Uh, this is just speculative, but I hope to have a mix of in-kind support, grants, fees and fines, services that we provide that we can, we can um, charge for, and fundraising. Yeah? Do you currently collect any of the uh, fines? No, nope. are... not currently. That we leverage in the city? Nope, we do not. And we haven't really even examined what fees and fines are out there that we might, you know, we know that the city is currently, you know, very stretched for resources, so this may not be the right time for us to be coming and, and asking fines to be designated for a particular thing, but we'd be happy to talk with you and see if you have ideas of, of there are fees or fines that you think that we could allocate for our work. That would be terrific. Yeah, um, what did you get last year? Eighty, $8,800, I think, in fines reflected on $100 tickets. Yep. Okay. Which was pretty substantial. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was quite a bit. It was quite a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We could do a lot with that amount of money. Yeah, what do we have out of it? I mean, the Committee on Disabilities well, that was on, well, it was handicapped we got for that. Right. But these fees are quite a lot of tickets. They oh, okay. For, they uh, had no money. for anything less than an ounce. Yeah. $8,800. I think it was. Wasn't it was in Maryland? Something like that, pretty close. It was a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Even, on, even if the state police stop a car on Route 91, if it's within the city limits, we get that we get that ticket. Okay. And that fine. Oh, interesting. So okay. it might be something to look at. Well, if, yes, definitely. If that is a fine that's currently going to the police department, however, we well, certainly we want to get fund. away from them. But the general fund. Okay, yep. great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. Which is the administration that, that put up the $125,000? Uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Well, the, the money actually comes from the, the White House, the Office of National Drug Control Policy. They then separate those into two branches. One is enforcement and one is prevention. They contract with Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to sort of uh, manage the money that goes for prevention. And then they put out a number of different grants, including the Drug-Free Communities Grant, which is the grant that we um, were awarded. So that's from the state? That's, no, it's from uh, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration is a federal oh, it's program. Also federal. Yeah. Other questions on this? Fundraising. Yes. How are you making uh... Well, the start that we've had on that so far is sort of necessity is the mother of invention. The um, iPad that we promised the winner of our logo design contest, we found out we could not purchase from our grant. <laughs> and likewise, uh, later you'll hear about a, a survey we did of parents. We, offered, we promised a $100 gift card. We can't purchase gift cards partly because of operating out of the city of Northampton and partly because our, our funder wouldn't allow us to do that. So we got creative and we got uh, um, 
a, a little dis uh, discount, $100 discount on the iPad from Yes Computers, and then the Smith College um, Center for Community Outreach, is that it? I can't remember the exact title of their, the division that we were working with, but they uh, provided the other $400. And likewise with the Stop and Shop gift cards, we got $20 from the local Stop and Shop and $80 from Smith College. So we've been very lucky to be able to just pick up the phone and call Smith and ask for some help and that the local retailers have been so generous. How about like Walmart? I mean, you see yeah. on TV, I mean, they do a tremendous amount of um, donating money for yeah. education right down the line. Absolutely. I think that there's a lot of sort of corporate entities that we could be asking for for money, grants that we could be applying for, individuals, you know, who have a stake in this and care about it and would like to give. Part of, part of it is we need to create some of the mechanisms to be able to, you know, accept some of that money. Some, for example, some funders require you to be a 501c3. Our fiscal agent is the city of Northampton, and so we can't apply for that. Um, and you know, there are other some sort of technical obstacles, but we are definitely rolling up our sleeves to start removing any obstacles to accepting money from anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Try the Coca-Cola plan. Uh, in uh, if you do a fundraising, uh, invite the Florida Savings Bank and East Hampton Savings Bank. All right. Thank you. Great. We will. Next slide. Um, so now we switch to the, uh, this, the work we do to actually reduce youth substance use. Um, we um, administer a survey every other year in the spring to 8th, 10th, and 10th, uh, 12th graders in Northampton. This includes JFK, Northampton High, and Smith Vogue. Actually, it's a survey which, thanks to Spiffy, is being conducted all over Hampshire County um, in every school district. Um, the, the surveys give us information not just on what youth are using, but why they are using it. So we're not just finding out, okay, you know, 90% or whatever percent of youth are using what substance. Um, but, uh, but we find out, oh, well, they, they perceive that their peers are using a lot, or they, their parents aren't maybe sending the, a clear enough message that it's wrong to use alcohol and drugs. So, these types of, um, this type of information gives us a, a lot better uh, capability to design um, interventions that will really be effective in Northampton for the local conditions that we have here. And uh, November 10th, we'll be presenting to the school committee some of the uh, most recent information we collected in just in spring of this year. Next slide. We also did, uh, this was partly a survey for our own purposes to learn, but it was also an educational opportunity. Um, um, seventh, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders at JFK um, participated in a survey of their, um, what they remembered from watching the Super Bowl, and it became a good discussion point and a conversation in the school to learn more about these issues. Um, Doritos, Coca-Cola, and Bud Light were the things that they most remembered <laughs> from the Super Bowl. Um, which, you know, lines up with, with what's happening nationally that um, these alcohol companies know that if they can get youth hooked early, they get them hooked for life. And so um, the messages they design are specifically targeted to be appealing to people even this young. It's chilling. Next step. Next slide. Um, we worked with the mayor to do a proclamation declaring a safe prom and graduation season. Next slide. And we, uh, that was in collaboration with a uh, youth social norms marketing campaign that we did to try to, um, to reflect back to Northampton seniors that uh, not everybody thinks, for example, that prom and graduation night, you absolutely have to drink alcohol or use drugs to make it a, a full celebration. Um, and so, uh, we, we did this at Northampton High School and got some great feedback from the youth on it. Next slide. We're also, and this is coming right up again, but in April we conducted, we, we didn't conduct it, the DA's office in collaboration with a lot of different groups, and I think um, some of you have seen this flyer already, um, but uh, the DA's office is the lead organizer, and um, in April, 1,470 uh, pounds of drugs were collected in Hampshire County, and 500 of those were uh, collected at Smith Oak in Northampton. The next 
Collection day is October 29th. Mm. I have a deposit of at Schmidt Volk in Northampton. Yeah, well, no, that, not from that school, but that was the collection site for the city of yeah. Northampton. <laughs> <laughs> make sure I had that right. Yeah, I'm glad that you did. I'm glad that you checked it about that. Yeah. Any other because questions? The event took place. Yes. <laughs> it <laughs> did, yes. And it's happening again, what's that, a week from Saturday? Because you let the high school out. Well, the <laughs> it just I'm wasn't like, what they chose as a collection site. <laughs> Next slide. We also are um, distributing right now the Safe Homes directory. Um, and it is a directory where a parents pledge to supervise parties where youth are present, prohibit youth substance use, and communicate with other parents. And it actually gives the names and phone numbers of the other parents who've made this pledge so that um, it just creates an opportunity for parents to sort of renew their commitment and also to see that other parents are and also to be able to actually reach out to other parents who are trying to do the right thing. Next slide. We worked with Spiffy, and um, they did the bulk lion's share of the work, but we co-sponsored the training of, uh, recent training of liquor retailers and staff. There was both this training that's on the slide, which is tips, um, which is uh, for people who are serving in bars and restaurants, and also, um, uh, what's the other one called? Mass Pack. Mass Pack, which is for, uh, targeted for uh, package stores. Now you also, didn't you work with community actions with that? Because um, we had them here and they talked about how they had worked with Oh, wonderful. Well, if they, they may have um, been a partner with us without me even knowing it. So there's so much collaboration going on sometimes, I don't know. But I wasn't aware of it. Next slide. And I'm pleased to announce we just got awarded $2,000 each from uh, $2,000 for Smith Volk and $2,000 for Northampton High School to be part of the 84 Project, which is a youth-led movement fighting for a tobacco-free generation in Massachusetts. And they, um, they look at the same, in the same way that we look at alcohol uh, marketing, or we looked at it earlier with the Super Bowl ads, they really look at the way tobacco products are marketed for youth, and there are a lot of new sort of really scary products for youth that adults aren't even on the radar screen for adults because they're not targeted for us. They're not in the magazines that we look at, they're not on the web pages that we look at, but the youth know about them and know how to get them and they look like candy or they, um, they look like uh, those tabs that you put on your mouth to freshen your breath, other things like that. So, uh, but we'll get to, this will be get to be exposed more in Northampton because of these mini grants from um, from, uh, the, I think it's, I forget who the, it's sort of like the Massachusetts T Tobacco Control Program subcontracts with someone else who then administers it statewide, but it, I think it's Massachusetts Tobacco Control Program funds which will be funding this project. Next slide. And Marisa, in just a second, will prevent on the Parent Social Norms Project, but before I give up on the, sta the stage, next slide. <laughs> I just want you to know that I'm here and I want to be a resource to you thinking about these issues. Here's my contact information and um, I'm happy to take any questions now or I can also wait until after Marisa's done with her presentation. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. And also, um, I want to recognize um, former Councilor Marilyn Richards and thank you for being here. Thank you. It's my um, So I'm Marisa Hebel. Uh, like Glenn said, I work for both uh, the Spiffy Coalition and the Northampton Prevention Coalition as a community prevention specialist. I'm going to talk to you today just about the Northampton Parent Social Norms Campaign, which Glenn alluded to. Um, I think a couple of years ago, Karen and a colleague of mine, Heather Warner, came to talk about the Parent Social Norms Campaign. So this might be a tiny bit of a refresher course for some of you. Um, and is it Mary? I forgot that you're the one who advances the slides here, so I may be annoying in how many times I say click, because there are a couple of slides that need a couple of clicks. So you can click. You can go ahead and yeah. Great. So um, social norms cam cam campaigns, um, Jeff Linkenbach is one of the grandfathers of social norms campaigns, and he said that people are influenced by their perception of how other members of their social group behave, which is the foundation of what I'm going to talk about. Please feel free to ask questions while I'm talking. 
Um, so the goals of this campaign, everything that we do is, is designed to decrease youth substance use. This particular campaign is also designed to increase the, parent, the use of parents using protective strategies, those things that buffer or reduce their children's risk. Um, a, a sort of side benefit of this campaign is when we put all these messages out in the community, they do create community awareness. So we consider that sort of a side goal that we get from this. So a quick refresher course for some of you in social norms theory. Um, we are social and we are influenced by the people around us. It, it's part of why we keep our lawns mowed, if we keep our lawns mowed. It's why more people are starting to use fabric grocery bags at the grocery store. It's just because we're influenced by what happens around us. This is one of those slides you can click. Um, we often misperceive what people around us are doing, though. Our perceptions are not always accurate. Click again, Mary. We tend to overestimate the healthy attitudes amongst our peers and underestimate, I'm sorry, we overestimate the unhealthy attitudes and underestimate the healthy attitudes. So this is particularly true um, in adolescence, where you may hear an adolescent saying, I'm a Northampton resident as well as a parent of teenagers, and I know that my son came home from freshman year of school and said, everyone's fighting, everybody's fighting. So we like really broke it down. At least everybody fighting, so like there had been a couple fights, and six kids were fighting, so there was like 865 kids that weren't fighting. Right? But we tend to, you know, our perceptions tend to be off in terms of those things, especially when it comes to things that we find exciting or different. You can click again there. So our perceptions influence our behavior, but our misperceptions also influence our behavior. And click again. So what social norms can do, campaigns do is publicize the actual prevalence of positive and healthy behaviors that we don't realize are the majority. Um, they create awareness about a particular issue. Um, so let's say last year, the last message that we ran was 90% of parents, of Northampton parents, um, would be upset if, an, if another adult served their teen alcohol. So that created awareness about adults serving teens alcohol, and it corrected misperception. Most people in town didn't realize that it was so prevalent to not want your teen served alcohol. They didn't realize quite how prevalent it was. And then behavior is influenced. So maybe a parent who didn't realize necessarily that they... Most people don't want them to serve alcohol to teenagers, and they've started to realize that and not and stop serving. So you can click. So this is what we do. We, we plan and, and do environmental advocacy. Part of what I'm doing right now is environmental advocacy just by filling you all in on what's happening. We survey parents. That's how we gather baseline data. Um, we look at the data, analyze it, and develop messages in the layouts. Um, we decide where we're putting it, where our parents, where are the best places to have these messages. Um, then we implement the campaign, and then we evaluate it to see how we're doing. And we're going into round two now, so you can click again. Why is it so important to support positive parent behaviors? That little far side thing just cracks me up. They're looking for it. They're hoping their, their child has a future in Nintendo <laughs> and PlayStation. So you can click again, Mary. I know. That's you can click again. So why it's so apparent. So this, I'm actually just going to give you a few data points from Spiffy, um, like Glenn was saying, surveys all the teens in Hampshire County in 8th, 10th, and 12th grade every two years. So I'm going to give you a little bit of Hampshire County students. This includes Northampton students. So students were asked, how wrong do your parents feel it would be for you to drink alcohol? And they had the option of saying, my parents think it would be very wrong, wrong, a little bit wrong, or not wrong at all. So you can click again, Mary. Amongst middle, middle school students, if a student said that their parents thought it would be very wrong, I think it was 9% had drank in the last 30 days, as opposed to a middle school student whose parent, who said that their parents would think it was not wrong at all. Almost more than 50% had drank in the last month. Um, and if you click again, amongst high school students, um, students said that their parents thought it would be very wrong to drink. 20% had drank as opposed to if their parents, if they thought their parents thought it was not wrong at all, um, more than 65%. Actually, I think it's about 70% had drank in the last month. So this is just to show that what parents say, if they, if, you know, teens get what they're saying. They get if they want them to do it or not, what their attitudes are about it, and that impacts teen use. So you can click again. The students were asked, how wrong do your parents feel it would be for you to smoke marijuana? And then if you click again. Amongst middle school students, um, I think that was about 6%, um, said that they had smoked in the last month amongst students who said their parents think it's very wrong for them to smoke, as, amongst a, as, as opposed to a parent said it was not wrong at all, 40% of them had smoked in the last month. I'm just giving the extremes to sort of um, explain what this slide means. And then click again amongst high school students, 
Um, about 10% had smoked if their parents thought it was very wrong among students whose parents didn't think it was wrong at all, over 60%. I find this slide interesting because teenagers have a tough time differentiating between a little bit wrong and not wrong at all. You see how close those are in the high school age? So I, I think that's a really good message for us to take to parents that you have to be really explicit about whether or not you think it's wrong or, or not wrong at all. So you can click on <coughs> Um, this is parent behavior. So students were asked, my family has clear rules about alcohol and drug use. And so if you click again, this is combining all teenagers. If a family had clear rules, the left side is alcohol. The right side is marijuana use in the last month. So amongst families that had clear rules on the left side, the use was lower than if families did not have clear rules in the last month. Do we have questions about those, or is that going to make sense people? Students were more likely to use if their, parent, their parents did not have clear rules about substance use. You can click again. But the difference. Oh, sorry. The alcohol. Interesting. Back one. Yeah. The pink. The pink is marijuana. marijuana. So if parents had clear rules about marijuana use, students were less likely to have used in the last 30 days. Thank you. Yeah. So the take-home message for that is that we need to get out the message that parents should have clear rules and, um, yeah, keep repeating them. So this is the first round. I hope you've seen some of these. Um, I know that Karen and I brought them earlier in the year, um, and um, that was the first round, and now we're into the second round. You can click again, Mary. Round two. So this summer, we surveyed Northampton parents. On the survey, we asked them questions about what they do and think, and then we asked them questions about what they think other Northampton parents do and think. And when we find there's a difference, a lot of parents are doing something really well, and that's what we find most often. Northampton parents are doing a lot very well to keep their teens safe and healthy. But they don't realize just how many of their peers are also doing that. So that's how we decide what kind of messages we're gonna use. We look at the data, we pick the messages. I'm just gonna give you two data points as examples. They're not data points that we're using. Um, if you click again, Mary. This is gonna be the probably annoying slide because I was gonna go slowly. So for example, 97% of Northampton parents make sure to meet their teen's closest friends. And if you click again. So it's the norm in Northampton to know who your teen's friends are. If you click one more time. But only 41% of Northampton parents think that it's the norm. So in other words, most Northampton parents don't think it's norm. It's the norm to make sure you meet your, parent, your teen's friends. 97% of parents know where their teen is and who he or she is with when their teenager's not at home, which we know parental monitoring is one thing that keeps teens safe. So it's the norm to know where your teenager is, but I think it's 57% of Northampton, only 57% of Northampton parents think it's the norm. So we have some work to do in educating parents and how, um, how their peers are really doing very much very well. We want, yes, we want to close the gap, right? We want the gap to be, we want more people to accurately perceive. But do you, I mean, um, why? Why do we want to close the gap? Because you're afraid that the 97% will go down to the 57? Oh, no, no, no. So, the, well, we actually would want, this is, these are actually not two messages that we're messaging on because they're, there's a, these are almost 100% of Northampton parents. What we would want to do is see, we would want to see that more Northampton parents, I don't, I don't want to get too technical here and confuse you, but what we want to see in analyzing the data after we do this is that, is that more Northampton parents think it's the norm. We want these two numbers to get closer together. We don't want to decrease the number of how many parents are doing anything well. We want to maintain that or increase that. We want to increase this number. We want parents to be accurately perceiving how many of their peers are doing the right thing. Because we know that that influences behavior. But 97% are already. Which is why we're not using this, this number. Oh, cool. um, this was an example. I didn't want to um, you know, give you all the, all the cool information so the away. The risk is, though, that, not, that the 97 would decline if you didn't have those two. Along. I've yet to see that, to be frank. I, I've yet to see that, that after a social norms campaign, that the numbers of people who are doing things well went down. But we would want to avoid that at all costs. But isn't that, I mean, according to the theory, that's what would happen. According to theory, if I if I publicize that ninety seven percent, not publicize it. If we did theory, nothing in two years. Oh, I see. This could get this could the ninety seven percent could decline. Yes, if we had not been out in the community. Yes, our, our hope would be that that would not happen. But yes. Okay, good. So we don't need ninety seven percent is pretty good. We don't need improvement in that on that. 
We would want to maintain that, but that's a great data point. I'm showing you these two actually because we're not using those two data points, and I didn't want to give up the whole campaign tonight. So, so what are we doing next? So right now we're in the midst of, and we've analyzed the data and we're developing the layout. So we work with a graphic designer who is the graphic designer that worked with the students to develop the logo. Um, we'll be doing that. We're doing in the midst of doing that. Um, implementation, you can click again. Implementation is our big the big piece. So over the next year, about every week, every eight weeks, um, new messages will flood the community in different ways. So um, every student, every parent of a student in grade 7 through 12 will receive a postcard with a message on it. And on the back, there'll be all these tips, ways to keep your teenager safe, and tips about the message and things parents can do. Um, newspaper ads, billboards, um, posters in the community. Um, if you have ideas about how we can get the message out and get the message to parents and out in the community, I would love to hear that. And then we'll, you can click one more time, Mary, and then we'll evaluate how we're doing. Um, and if we find well, something's not working, then we'll regroup and do something different. So I'd like to see you come to City Council and do a presentation. I think when, I would love to do that, um, I think that when Karen um, and Glenn present in, I don't know actually if you guys are going to be talking parent social norms, but if you'd like to, me to talk separately about this, I can. Yeah, I would really, really like to have that done. I can certainly do certain I mean, that. because you're talking about people watching city council meetings, and we've been having quite a bit of um, presentations coming in lately. Mm -hmm. I've been telling people, come in, and it helps. It really, you know, I spoke for like 30 seconds in March when Karen spoke most of the time. I spoke, and people were stopping me on the street saying, I saw you. And I was like, really? So, yeah, that'd be great. It's certainly a great way to get that message out. So, um, and I think that's it. So, does anyone have questions? How do you approach that in public? We tried it once here. How do we do what? Approach. What? You know, the access to in the, uh, in the high school and things such as that. We tried it here one time. And oh, okay. Should I talk to you? I think it's what Councillor Casey's talking about. But there was concerns with one councillor before about the use, wasn't it, about the use of marijuana in the schools and so forth. Drugs in general. Yeah. yeah. But I think that the way that you're approaching this and educating the public is very, very valuable. And I mean, you can't go wrong with what you're presenting. <laughs> Thank you. You know, yeah. I mean, I am really pleased with what I see. Well, I'm so happy to hear that. We stand on the shoulders of giants, really. I mean, this work has been going on for a long time with the Spiffy Coalition and the Northampton Task Force. and all the people who have developed these kinds of programs, and then all we do is just try to cha tailor fit it for Northampton um, and get more people involved. So I'm excited that, that, that you like it. I hope that more people will you know, come to the table, come to meetings, roll up their sleeves, be on a work group, because we can really expand the, the, our influence. The I enjoyed going to the meeting. Yeah, it was fun. wonderful to have you there. And it was wonderful yeah. having you there as well, Owen. Because so. if, if you make the presentation, it takes the politics out of it. <laughs> Say more about that. Yes, it's like it a does. stone wall here. Uh, <laughs> or it's like facing a Sherman tank. Um, so. Great. Well, we got to off the hook. happy to make presentations. We're talking about our youths in the schools. Mm -hmm. Youths in the schools. Mm -hmm. Okay. But. Okay, so either they have a problem with either the smoking or, or drugs mm -hmm. or alcohol. Mm -hmm. But what about their families in general? Sometimes they come from families that are broken, mm -hmm. broken up families. Mm -hmm. There's problems there. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's another problem mm -hmm. is the type of environment that they are put into. Well, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that part of what we're seeing is that, you know, as far as use in the schools, our numbers aren't particularly high. But what concerns us is when we see a lot of data showing that um, that youth in general are perceiving that their attitudes, uh, the parent attitudes towards alcohol and drug use are high. Uh, but, but I also want to say, I want to sort of make a, I guess, I think parents are really fighting an uphill battle here. 
I mean, these corporations have millions of dollars and they're, they're trying to undo any of the good work that the parents are doing. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of a David, David and Goliath thing. And yeah, families are stretched right now. But as we can see from the, the data that Maurice is presenting and that you'll see a lot more in the community, there are a lot of parents doing the right thing and they maybe just need to have that reinforced more and they maybe just need more opportunities for conversations with their youth so that when parents feel that they are putting out clear messages, the youth are actually receiving a clear message. So sometimes there's a discrepancy there as well. So, yeah. Well, I want to thank all three of you for being here to our Committee on Social Services and Veterans Affairs, and hopefully Pleasure. next year we'll have you back. That would be wonderful. <laughs> but really think about coming in to do a presentation. That's Absolutely. Great. I think Marissa would be excellent to do that. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. As soon as we can get it printed out, I'll have it delivered to somebody tomorrow. Any place special you'd like it to go? Does Rebecca know where to find you? Yes. Okay. Um, I cover the Hilltown. I'm the deputy director for the office. And I only come down here maybe once or twice a week. I'm not sure where everybody or who everybody is. On this sheet, then, um, what we've got is all kinds of information uh, based on towns that are paid in at the top. Uh, so far, my little town of Chesterfield, where I live, is the only one that's actually sent in its um, assessment. And they sent in the entire assessment. So, uh, a letter is going out to remind the other communities that their assessments are due. Joe, when do these assessments have to be end? What's the deadline? I don't believe there is a deadline. I, I didn't see one in the contract itself. I think you guys were first pretty much through all last year, too. Before the city got paid? Yeah. yeah we were trying were to work. First. Chesterfield was always coming early. We're trying to not have that happen again. Yeah. Maybe Norbert might be able to ask or answer your question, Constantine. I'll try. About the assessments? Oh, that you have to ask that here, Steve. I don't no. know. Yeah, yeah, no. I didn't think that's outside that's my, 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 my That's right. I know it just feels the only one, and I didn't see anything in when I was delivering the contracts that gave them 
a by a. I don't know if it was left out intentionally or by mistake or just wasn't thought about. I was just so, curious if there was like a deadline where these assessments had to be put in. Because if you're the only one that has placed it, and we have all these other little towns that have not, and if there's not a deadline, so I can see they're just going to lay back on it and do it when they want. Yes. But they are they are faithful about paying. I mean, they all did pay it last year. We didn't have to chase anybody. I think right now if we just sent out a letter reminding them mm -hmm. to send it in and probably even give them to the end of this calendar rather than the fiscal year, given the end of the calendar, I, I think you'd see them all come in. Okay. We don't get any of the return, the 75% until after the first of the year anyway. That's the money paid out by Northampton to its veterans. We're talking about the assessments right. that the little towns are paying yep. in. Yep. And the state is six months to a year and a half behind paying on their 75%. Yeah. How many months? Six months to a year and a half. Eighteen months. We don't see that getting any better in the future either. Well, that whole computer system business that they installed two years ago was supposed to speed that up. And it actually, when I was just doing the little towns by myself, um, the towns weren't getting reimbursed for almost three years. So I think the, the new computer system has helped, yeah. but I mean it took it from three years down to what they call a year it? and a half. What do they call it? Business or something? Business. I mean I don't remember what the letters stand for. Fifteen percent yeah. increase in efficiency. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, like billion dollar computer system. Yeah. So uh, what, why why the delay? Is it legislative? Is it no? I just think they're the over people. I think they're over cash. They're all, they're cash saturated in Boston. Um, I think because the economy's so bad. The, amount of influx of veterans coming onto the program. I don't think the computer, when they put the program in, I don't think they were thinking it was going to expand that much in usage. And then it's just, it's the state of Massachusetts that takes off. Hmm. So, um, below that, then you can see that um, what we've been doing, uh, let's see what you call it here, services, in helping veterans, uh, the numbers have broke out. And this is only the information for since July 1st of this year. I believe Steve must have gave an update of that at the close of the fiscal year last year. Yes. So we only went back and pulled in the information starting from the first of this year on how many veterans or pieces of things we filed or meetings we've attended. Do notice that we don't have parades on here. What, what is the chapter one for this? That's the that's the main core of what we do in veteran services. Chapter one fifteen is the state program that began in eighteen sixty seven, and it's a program that was designed before the VA was even invented to assist Massachusetts veterans uh, with money coming back from war. Right now, I would say it's a stopgap program. It's, we see the veterans coming on to Chapter 115 and filing their paperwork with the VA, getting accepted into the VA system, and then dropping off Chapter 115, staying on for the rest of their lives with the regular VA, the federal program. Where that doesn't happen is on a lot of the elderly especially widows up in the hill towns. Most of my clients in the hill towns are widows of veterans. They're on Chapter 115. They're not entitled to anything from the VA because they're widows. So they usually stay on Chapter 115 until they pass on. Now, what do they get from, if they're a widow, what do they get from Chapter 115? They'll get an amount of money per month to the system. Does it go by? How much they it's an income-based program that qualifies them first, number one, and that also adjusts how much money they would get from Chapter 115. So I've seen people give as little as two dollars, 
is in the high upper area. I think the most expensive I've seen is twelve hundred dollars. But on top of that two dollars though, uh, there's this thing called the spend down. Really. You know, this business computer system, you put in all the income and it goes and runs off and calculates everything and their mortgage payments, their taxes, their homeowners insurance, etc. etc. And then it comes back and says, okay. Expenses aren't offsetting the, uh, the amount of money they got coming in, so they're only entitled to a $2 benefit, but then they also qualify for reimbursement of their co payments and medical expenses. Mm -hmm. And to a lot of the elderly, that's, that, that's they will think to get that. You know. It's a, a needs basement. I've seen the formula, I think it works out pretty well. It's just it's whether or not you need it. Correct. Period. You know, you could be in, I wouldn't want. Millionaire widow to be getting right, a benefit. So the and, 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 and the formula is pretty exact, also. And yes. so if it comes out to be two dollars, that's because that's you don't need it. It's just two bucks. Right, but like the <coughs> counselor, that also there's an importance here that covers the medical part. Sure. And that's huge. Yeah. Co-pays such as the medication. Right. There's a, is there any prescription plan in that? Yes, there is. Right, but I was, there was something, he mentioned something like, I don't know, I lost it. I need a couple calls. Yeah, I know, that sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm thinking about the, the millionaire widow getting Oh, money. the millionaire widow, yes. When we're putting the information into the computer and it goes into a, a DBS in Boston, they have investigators since then. The people sign releases that, and it's a long release, it's got to have 30 items that they're saying DBS, Long Infection Services in Boston look into their background for. So they run the background checks through people's checking accounts and banks, cars, loans, etc. Uh, they get all the government entities that they would be getting money coming in from, seeing if they got a military pension or a railroad pension, mm -hmm. things like that. And they've had cases where, you know, they found someone squirreling away IRAs and lying about it. Yeah. And then, well, they're forced to pay back the money. And if they don't, it comes out of their state tax return. Yeah. And different institutions have different um, different benefit packages too. I know over um, I, a friend of mine passed away, and her husband um, got a hundred thousand uh, dollar death benefit on Barnes. You know, and that had to put a damper on the one fifteen. Correct. Um, until they spend it down. Until they spend it down. Yeah. So. So once they spent it down, then she would get it. Yeah, I think the formula. I think the formula works out. Yeah, yeah, and that, and that as well as it can. Right, and that spending of that is also looked at as well. You know, they go out by a weird job. Yeah, there you go. Don't come crying to us now because you need fuel. You need money for fuel to fly the Uh huh. Yeah. someone to come in and assist the veteran for the, the will. You mean at home? At home, yes. That's not covered, you know, under us. That's federal money. Yeah. What we do is assist with the paper. Okay. Like a home health aid or something. Correct. Yeah. Or a cook, laundry, cook, anything. Right. Provide a service. Activities of daily living is what they call it. Yeah. Again, Again it's, in their home. it's another one based on needs and yeah. where you fall on the economic ladder. Now the death benefits, that means only three this year? What's death? Yeah. The death um, benefits, since three. July. Since July. Since July. Yes, of course. That we've helped get them the, the death benefits. Money from the board. You're still in young forms. Okay. 250 bucks or something, $200 or something? It, well, it's more than just that. It's, it, it, that's misleading when we say benefits. It's also working with them to get, make sure they get the gravestones and yep. what will happen. Yep. Honor guard, the color guard, 
the taps, the yep. flags of the casket, I mean, whatever it might take. But yeah, there's only been, there's one up in the hill towns and three down here, actually. Hmm. But, so that's just some talk. The newest thing on here, the start of this year, is the uh, Hampshire County Jail Release Program and the um, Mentoring Program. We're working with the district attorney's office, um, and I attend meetings at the jail once a month and at the district attorney's office, Steve and I, and we go over the veterans that are being released and make sure that they're going into something, if they need to go into something, mm -hmm. and if that assistance means going to soldier on to the VA or going to one of the shelters, or actually Function, function um, in society. In society, you know, requires them to get on chapter 115 until we can get them into something else. Mm -hmm. And we're also trying to work with the district attorney's office and setting up a veterans court like they've done out in Buffalo, New York. Oh, I never heard of it. Oh, yeah. Uh, we're going to be starting here in Northampton where the district attorney is appointing one judge, one DA, and one. Thank you. Our defender, uh, who will handle just the cases coming in at District League Veterans, and then we will be there to make sure that we can follow through on whatever the judge decides. Instead of maybe putting him in jail, they may put him straight into a, an alcohol program at the VA, a drug rehab program. Well, that's, that's a skill set by itself. Yes. Yeah. So, when are you going to be starting now? Yeah, it started July 1st, going to the prisons and things, and um, the district attorney hopes to have the court part of it up and running uh, by December. Call Dave. <laughs> well, I, I know, like, with Dave Sullivan, Mary Carey, who does the community outreach, she's excellent. And he had hired her because we had her at the fire station with us doing outreach and we did the neighborhood watch on that. So I could see probably where she might be involved with this outreach. Yeah, she was at the table. Mm -hmm. COA appearances. Uh, Council on Aging. Yep. Appearances. They have breakfasts, sometimes they have lunch, sometimes they have dinners. Yep. And we constantly make the rounds of all the towns, trying to be there uh, just to get the word out to the veterans that we're in. Yep. I mean, it's not too much here in the city. It's, it's up in the hill town, so yep. it's hard to get the word out. So if you don't have a senior center in Chesterfield, do you? Yeah, we the Marine Hall. Oh, that's right. That's right. And then uh, Worthington has one. Cummington uses... Uh, Chesterfields and yep. Ocean's use in Williamsburg. So, you know, bounce around the hall to try and connect, show up. And every once in a while, about every other time, I'll find someone who goes, oh, yeah, I didn't know there was a chapter 115. Oh, yeah, I was in the Army back then, and yeah, I've never been to the VA. Come here, I'm going to fill out this form. Yeah, I got out of the service and I just said, I've never been up to the VA for any services. I've been up there to pick guys up to take them to work. Are you in the assistant? Oh, I haven't got a clue. Okay, no. Probably not. You should go up and sign up. We're fine. Oh, well, I'm not saying you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so far. But the more, net, the more numbers that you have, the more funding that we see yeah. that they can do more with. I'll go sign up. I tell everybody, go down to Soldier Home, same thing. Yeah. That's where they help. That's where we really need the numbers. Down to Soldier, soldier Home. So if the government doesn't try to close it. Why is he thinking of doing Tried twice already. Well, twice I know already. he did that, but you know, I never heard talk about it. It could happen. That's not correct, Joe. But we're having a lot of luck that you can start up with the dental program down here. It's supposed to be a trap. You're having a lot of luck? Yes, we're getting people to go down and sign up for the dental program. Yeah. They reopened the dental, dental clinic down at Sully's home. I, mean, I was down there. Meeting Paul came on the last day. He's the head of the soldiers. He figures 
out of our communities up here, we've sent them over 270 clients. So, you, know, you guys are working hard. I, mean, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a big help that the economy is as bad as it is, too. Mm -hmm. I've heard Steve talk about Mr. Rusko, Rusko, but never knew who you were. A Russo. Okay, I never knew who you were. So I think this is great that you're here this evening because it okay. doesn't hurt to bring people in so we know who he's talking about. So thank you. And I also want to introduce you to Councilor Owen Daniels Freeman from Ward 3, and this is Councilor Eugene Casey from Ward 7, and I'm City Councilor Mary Ann LaBarge from Ward 6. So Norbert, it'd be really great, you know, when there are issues like this, and especially when he's working with our veterans agent, that he also come in and give us updates. So you could write that on your notes. Just spell your last name. R U S S O. That was easy. Yeah. It's a county. Uh -huh. Yeah, it is. What's the rules? Could you just tell me a little bit more about the dental program? Well, they said it's right there. Oh. And they closed it. So what they've done is they've contracted with Valley Health Dental Service. Valley Health Dental Service. And you go down there and you get what's called a blue card. Sliding scale, you can get dental services from the, the fee depending upon where you're at. But it, makes, it does make it affordable, especially for the a lot of our veterans that couldn't have dental care any other way. Uh -huh. Is that relatively new? Yes. So, not relatively. I said last year or? Oh, no, uh, July 1st. July 1st. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had a clinic there, and <coughs> the governor closed it. Then reopened it temporarily. We, we yeah, reopened it for six months, and then they closed it again. And now it's reopened again in July. Let's hope it stays open. The, the, the reason for its need is that most people realize is that the only veterans entitled to dental at the VA is 100% service connected. Period. And so now this would do a sliding scale, is yeah. that right? So you could get that. Well, you might be paying more than your own. You were saying it was okay. Right? It's going to be terrible. But it's good they can have it. It is. Good they can have it. I mean, you can watch TV. They talk about your teeth all the time. Mm -hmm. And without having your teeth taken care of, you're going to have some major, major medical problems. So I think this is great. And I would highly suggest that they think about closing it down again. We all get together and be very vocal against it. Yeah, we're right. the last time, and that's why the government was forced yeah. to reopen it yeah. mm -hmm. or keep the soldiers on all the mm -hmm. Pushed around the night and then. Get all these yanked out and get some other tired of rushing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't write that down. I see that um, Jerry Clark is here, yep. and Norbert, is he going to be talking with you on he, he's going to cover the, the Veterans Day Parade? On and, the, I'll be covering the, the parade. And who's going to be doing the uh, Veterans Honor Breakfast? I can also cover that. Too. So then we don't need Jerry right now. Well, if you want to uh, one Can I come forward? We like Jerry. Well, I thought there was <laughs> others like coming Jerry. in for the tour. Uh, good thing. Are there any others coming in for the tour? Uh, they should be, but I'm not quite sure. I'm going to wait on that, so why don't we have great. you go, no problem. No go problem. right into the Veterans no Day Parade? Situation normal. The responses are dribbling in. I'm working on getting the flyover, working on getting the permit. I'm an intern working on that. i got to follow up on that tomorrow. It's very standard. And uh, the only minor modification to it is I'm going to suggest the Veterans Council, instead, instead of stepping off at 11 a.m., we step off at 11 minutes and 11 seconds after 11 a.m. Oh, okay. 11, 11, 11. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, great. <laughs> when else are you going to be able to do that? Why not? Why not? Let's do it. Yeah, that's, so, uh, Why and, not? and also, we are going to move the ceremony off of the front steps where everybody freezes. Oh, thank God. And, and, and where the front of the hall acts like a 
sound reflector over into Plasky Park. Perfect. Oh, perfect. What's up? For platforms, well, you know, as you come out of my office into the park, mm -hmm. left you have what I call the mound, only two steps up to it. Mm -hmm. So we'll have the idea to have the platforms up there. So there's a big chair to sit in front. And got a nice two chairs back. And it's sunny we're, there. With sunny there, uh, we're, we're back from the street. The leaves should be down, so we won't be in the shade, and it'll be quieter. I remember Michael Ryan trying to talk and his jaw freezing up out there. It was so cold that and the wind was blowing. <clears throat> the I wind, think that's wonderful. The wind we can't control. No, but, but at least... We'll have some sunshine. Exactly. Because, I mean, because, and especially sitting on the metal chairs. Uh -huh. it, it's, it's not pleasant to sit in front of a real hall. No, <laughs> it isn't. As for the uh, veterans breakfast... Uh, take now, can I ask you about the veterans day parade? Where are we meeting? The, the, the Down by Bridge Street School? Uh, by Bridge Street School, at Lampert Park, uh, everything as, as in years past. A uh, form up is at 10. And we step off of 11, 11, 11. I like it. Now, and uh, we'll put the standard route, we'll march up Bridge okay. Street to Main Street, Main Street to Glasky Park. Go to the park, the ceremony will be as in years past, we'll have the colors, all the colors. I'm, I'm trying to find a replacement for our lovely young ladies, and I'm hoping to see now these back in Greece can, can help me on this. Because we had Miss Hunter Hart and Miss Flinker for several years there as our vocalists, and you remember their very hard act. Mm -hmm. But I believe one of their, one of them has a younger sister who was also into music. So I'm going to try to, uh, I am going to uh, pursue that. But having a vocal, especially a young person, has so much. Who was the, the young man that we had before? That was... But he's not around anymore. Oh, no, he's, he's gone pro. That's what I've heard. He, he's gone pro. He's, I think he's even got his own album out or something. And, he's and good. Seth, uh, Seth Gleer. Gleer. Seth Gleer was his name. What a voice he had. Can I give you a suggestion? Sure, sure, kid. If you could talk to District Attorney Dave Sullivan, on his inauguration day at the courthouse, he had a very young girl, and he knows who she is, and she has such a beautiful voice, and she did. Was his did daughter? you see her? Back. No, that well, was not no, his no, daughter. I, yeah, she's already singing at my bedroom for you. Who is she? Uh, I can't remember the girl's name. Beautiful yeah, voice. I, I have first ones. Oh, beautiful. I like it. Beautiful voice. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but we, we've always been very successful and we say, um, see in a better context, tell me where to go, and uh, I'll have a draft. I, mean, I don't remember which young lady had the sister. Mm -hmm. Hi, did you, which, which one did you get? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we will work on getting a vocalist and have the same quality program. Well, Dave Sullivan might be able to help Matt, you out. I sure might not know somebody else. Yes, you know, talk right, to I don't Dave or either. Talk, talk to DA Sullivan. Mary Carey. Mary Carey? Yeah. She's that, that's the gal. She, he's got. No, no, no. Mary Carey is the one who handles oh, the that? community. Oh, Albert. Mary Carey's an assistant. But she was oh. at that inauguration that day, and she might be able to help you. Okay. Finding another young woman like that one. Okay, well, that's that's on the plate for tomorrow. Yep. Is the one to talk to. Now, is there anything happening after the parade and after the function here? Oh, uh, well, collation as usual. Lunch. Where is that? Jerry, do we? American Legion. American Legion. Bay State. American Legion Bay State. Collation will be American Legion Bay State. Subject, subject to change, but that's yeah. the uh, tentative plan right now. Okay. Immediately following. <laughs> so that takes care of the Veterans Day parade, correct? Now the breakfast. Breakfast is a generic flu to Veterans Breakfast. Because of, the, because of the tribute tour, our fundraising and our main effort went in with those two groups. This year it's generic, flu to all veterans. We're not going to strike a coin or anything like that. So we have to, it would 
otherwise would have interfered with our fundraising for the tribute tour, which was essential. Every, every dollar, was, as you'll find out, was essential. And it's $12 a head. Tickets are available. I have them in the office. Uh, I'm working on getting a color guard. I believe I get it from Western New England University or from Florence. And <coughs> I have the Piper lined up as we had in past years. We are working on getting a speaker. Uh, uh, our, uh, our chaplain. I should have brought the program up. I'm so terrible on names. Rudy Byer. Yep. If he can make it. His wife's having health issues. So we can have to find him on the channel. And uh, it'll be the standard to uh, hold that pass. But in this case, it'll be non specific. It'll be just a salute to it. Also, it may indeed become a reunion for the denizens of the tribute tour. Now? If I can remember how to unset and reset the alarm, I'd run over and grab one for you right now. But with my luck, every you cruiser in town would. No, I'll down. come down and get one. I'll I come down and get one. Every cruiser in town would be one. I'll wait till you get your computer hooked back up and the plug's back in and rewire it. It's working now. Find it? Yeah, it's working now. Okay. Only have my new one on home while on the fridge. Two very brainy people spent a long time trying to figure it out. So one of the brainy people decided, hey, well, let's call tech support. Got to fix it 15 minutes. <coughs> okay, my question is I want to thank you for being here. And also, Norbert, as usual. Thank you. And I think, why don't we bring Jerry Clark up now? And there one, and one, one question for uh, the new district for Norbert. I've asked you to apply. Yeah, well, really? we were going to think, uh, go for that particular funding you see from he calling into question. And once I've now that finished the tour, I was going to give you a call saying, where are we going from here? Okay. All right. Okay. I'll be in touch with you in the next I week. mean, we could just steam ass and no whole bank, but I really don't think that's appropriate. We'll get it figured out. We'll figure it out. But, but now that the tour is over, we can get back on that. Yeah. Jerry, thank you for being here. Do you know if Tommy Pace is coming? Um, I'm surprised he's not here. Something must have come up. And Brad is supposed to be here. That's our business with Mr. Russo. That's our business with Mr. Russo. Number one. Number one. Yeah, he wants to stay here. Please do. Okay, Jerry. Okay, thank you. But, uh, overview of the uh, tribute tour that uh, the Veterans Council of Northampton, and just so people don't know me, I'm Jared Clark, president of the Veterans Council of Northampton, and uh, very proud of the uh, membership. Uh, the uh, Veterans Council consists of 15 organizations within Northampton, both uh, veterans and uh, civic organizations. Done quite a bit over the last four or five years to uh, rejuvenate the Veterans Council. So we've done quite a bit from the Veterans Practices in order to set the parades. And um, what was set out to do was to uh, do a tribute tour, which was Tom P's um, dream. I won't speak for him, but uh, he's a member of the VFW, which is one of the uh, members of the Veterans Council. And he approached the Veterans Council and said, What if we did a tour of Washington, D.C. and the monuments for our World War II and Korean veterans. Um, biggest part was to find out who they were and when they wanted, if they were able to come. One of the uh, criteria said that it would be a person who entered Northampton um, as their home of record in World War II and Korea. So that was the criteria, which, uh, um, and we ended up with eight World War II veterans, 
and we ended up with 15 Korean veterans that uh, wanted to go on the tour. Uh, that included seven spouses and 12 spouses of the Korean veterans. We uh, had four committee people and three of the committee people happened to be Vietnam veterans and uh, we had two spouses that uh, went along with us. The, uh, we should note that the committee and the spouses of the committee paid their own way. So all the money that we raised were for the World War II and the Korean veterans and their spouses. Um, it was a uh, budget that uh, was, um, I thought was something we couldn't uh, get, but we did. And uh, we're right on budget, just a little bit over. So as the bills come in, uh, I think we're going to be very happy. And the uh, people of Northampton, the uh, businesses, and the individual people that uh, gave, it's unbelievable. What did you raise here? Uh, Twenty-three thousand. Well, we have more money coming. Yeah. Well, it's the checks in the mail number. Right. The, the checks up was cut once, but made out to the wrong well, for people. Okay. So, well, so, so twenty-three thousand. But that's we have to, we have to wait for all the in today's economy. Yeah. And the uh, the veterans organization, our own group that uh, contributes, <coughs> as everyone knows, they're everybody's in dire straits. So financial things that they really stepped forward. There are some banks that really stepped up. And, but the individual contributions of a $100, um, you know, I, I can't believe somebody would you know, do that, but it was for that spirit of making sure that these World War II and Korean veterans got a chance to see their memorials and uh, their monuments. So they must uh, have so it worked. Do you have an idea of how many had never been down there to see them? Um, I would just... You know, my father was a World War II veteran. He never went down to see anything. But the people that were on the trip that never have seen it? Yeah. Um, I would probably say out of the 23, I would probably say 20 have never seen it before. Wow. So this was their was perfect. one shot deal. Yeah. Um, and that was a goal of the Veterans Council. Whenever we say we, and uh, Dr. Norbert, myself, or Tom Keyes, it's the Veterans Council that did this, so uh, don't misquote us. You know, that, Unbelievable. That they Fantastic. pulled this off, and uh, just some of the uh, notes that we've got back from the people that were on the, on the trip just makes it so worthwhile, and uh, it's amazing that we did it. What we, the criteria of that home of record was really tough, yes, because there were so many people that wanted to go on the trip that had lived in Northampton for 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And we told them that, sorry, your home of record doesn't you know, fit. And uh, what we did do, we were able to do, was take care of every World War II vet. Some of the Korean vets that were on a waiting list, we couldn't accommodate them. Um, again, hard thing to do is say, okay, how many people do, how many people are going to go? And then say how much money do we have to raise? So we set cut off dates, and, and it worked fairly well. And I think everybody was satisfied. Um, um, Mary has um, some excellent pictures, and I know. Oh, I haven't. Oh, really? Yeah. Is that on? Is that that? Or really? Who's in the cassette? And Jerry, because I know on November third. Right. At the city council with a presentation. Yes, we're going to have nine people there. Yeah, I think I, I would like your opinion on this of running this. That would be great. Before you are, how would you want to work this out? Run this first and then speak no, about the tour. What do I you think? think? If that was in the background, uh, I don't think it just take away. It, it I just don't think it take away from anything of the presentation. But what? Would you want her to just like, because she'll have to operate that. Yeah. Well, so, ask Mary, what do you think? Mary, what do you think of having that in the background while we're doing a presentation? I think it can be done. Uh, I think that would be wonderful. I know the uh, bus was supposed to come in at like 4.30, and then it was going to come in at 4, and I was on a roof. It was supposed to pour that night, and I had to close the roof up, and 5.30 uh, 
came around and I was just getting off the roof and I was running down to the Elks parking lot and everything was all over with. Yeah. Well, didn't they come in at 4? We, we had originally thought they, we left at 8 o'clock and it's an 8 hour trip and we had the, uh, we stopped twice and to unload and load these people back up is a good uh, half hour. I mean, you're talking about every, everything we did, the council plan was you're dealing with 80, 90 year old people. So it's not like, okay, get off the bus, exactly. go to the bathroom, and come back on. So, and most of them had to have a wheelchair or a, uh, some type of uh, assistance. assistance to get to the, the facility and back. So, but we made it back and got out of Washington, D.C. in record time, which uh, you know, can take you forever to get out of there. So we're about an hour ahead of time, and then we backed it up another half hour. And so the 4.30 that we planned on being there ended up 4 o'clock. And fortunately, we got into uh, town about 3.30, and everybody's saying, hold it up, hold it up. We don't have the people there yet. And tell, tell these people that have been for four right. days that you want to hold it up. Yeah. They yeah. just yeah. wanted yeah. to go home. So uh, they were our main priority. So but, when Tom uh, Peace said we were going to do this, what did you think? You first came up with it, the idea. Did you think it would? Oh, I, I told him we wouldn't be able to do it. You know, the uh, money. One, the uh, money and uh, going back to that. But I think coming into town was that uh, it was planned uh, to have a uh, police escort um, to pick us up at uh, coming off 91 and give these people a final, not a final, the final leg of the trip, a welcome home back to uh, the outside where they started four days earlier. And just to see those people on the bus, when they said, wow, this is Northampton, doing this for us. And uh, it was something that was arranged that, you know, the, an accident happened, that cruiser was gone, and so much for the escort. But it just meant so much, so much to these people. Uh, just those extra little touches of the city of Northampton doing this for our Northampton veterans. And uh, it's something that they'll never forget. Especially at a crucial time when the economy is not good, but people yeah. did come out. So I think you're going to see with our city now more people getting involved, and that's what we want working with the community. I think if you look behind you, that picture right there is on the front page of the Gazette. Yeah. Uh, mission accomplished, meaning the, uh, the Veterans Council set out to do anything. Tommy Pease had his dream, everything was accomplished. And, uh, to see those eight World War II veterans, five of them in wheelchairs, uh, in front of their memorial, and uh, to the back is Massachusetts. All those things that are in the back is each and every state. And we've had that picture taken with Massachusetts in our background. Everything was really, you know, I, they, it, I don't know. It was, it was great. And uh, I think that I'd like to bore you with one, we've gotten a lot of thank yous to uh, the Veterans Council of Northampton, which you know, is part of um, What we did was we went to every uh, monument starting in World War II, and this is where their backs are to <coughs> a wreath at every monument. And we read the names of every Northampton veteran that died during World War II. And that started it. And then when we went to the Korean Memorial, we placed another wreath there. And the uh, 
had a couple people, Korean veterans, talk about their experience. And it was one thing to have our own group do it, but people yeah. from, we, our 51 people or 48 people that were around our little ceremony grew to about 75 to 100 people that were listening to our ceremony. So, and then when we went to the Vietnam Veterans um, Wall, it was the same thing. And when we went to Iwo Jima, the Marines Corps Memorial, and we had happened to be four veterans from Leeds, Massachusetts, that uh, Korean veterans that create a place to read and did the hand salute. All these things were so emotional that uh, the people that were on the tour, it just made all of us, at the end of the tour, all of us veterans, and it had no difference of whether you're a World War II, Korean, or Vietnam veteran. This, again, this wasn't for the Vietnam veterans, but we, we were all just one group. And if you ever talk to anybody who's on the tour, you're going to feel that same thing. So again, that's mission accomplished. And I really don't, don't want to lose this. <coughs> yeah. Is that from yeah. somebody who yeah. went on to the tour? Um, yeah, and I, I can imagine. I, I'll just I'll I'll just read when when I was talking about the uh, the uh, memorial, visiting and laying wreaths at all the monuments sites brought tears to our eyes. In Washington, it was also heartwarming to receive words of thanks from folks of all ages for the service our group gave to our country. When it's all said and done. Our country surely is the best. Um, that's just one line. Yep. That's somebody saying it other than me. Um, mm -hmm. Richie Neal did a great job. We had a chance to uh, see our congressman, and uh, he spent 35 minutes with us. And you can see the uh, people sat there and uh, asked him questions. We talked about uh, uh, Social Security, Medicare. You know, all the things that are happening with the Republicans and the Democrats, but uh, for him to take out his time, and that was arranged again by the group. I could go on and on and on, but uh, I think the picture said a lot. Oh, it sure does. And, uh, I've spoken to four people that were on it. And I'll never forget, it was, uh, yeah. again, they said it was, uh, Gloria said it was, it was life changing. Again. <laughs> I think that was one of the goals was to give those veterans from the city of Northampton and the service during the World War II in Korea a chance, once in a lifetime chance, all expense <coughs> tour to see their, their memorials memorials and the monuments in Washington, D.C. Good job. Very well done by the, sure by the Veterans Council. Unbelievable. Come a long way. I, had, I, I was so skeptical when Tommy was telling me about it. It's a lot of money to raise. So was I. That's why we made the chairman. <laughs> <laughs> what a job. I mean, I can't even explain it to you. I mean, I mean, how I felt when it, when it found out. Even like the Elks, they all, so many, so many people stepped up to the plate. Yeah. I mean, just at the Elks, we raised, what, Jerry, 4000 something? $4,300. They took a, what they thought would be a $500 donation. They were willing to give $1,000, uh, which some of the other organizations did. They took that $500 and said, what if we take that $500, buy food, do a spaghetti dinner, which was a lot of the ideas that came up. From you people yep. earlier, yep. and uh, go out and sell the tickets. We'll provide all the facility, all the volunteers, and they turn that into four thousand three hundred dollars. So uh, you know that really did put us over the top, I must say. But so now that you've set the bar so high, what's next? Uh, <laughs> they need I can do it again. <laughs> Never say no. I mean, I'm serious. I mean, no. well, you started at the top. We could take them over to Norfolk. Go oh my God! Go <laughs> <laughs> you just said something also on TV. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, anyhow, um, I think we set out what we wanted to do. Can't be more proud of it. Yep. Uh, I want to thank the Veterans Council for 
all the hard work that you've done. And to be honest with you, the way Tommy Peace talked, that it was from his heart, he was so assured that he was going to go ahead and make that dream happen. And every time he came to city council and spoke, or at our meetings, that was in his heart. And I felt that you were going to raise the money. When you have somebody who's really determined like that, good thing he was the chair. <laughs> so thank you, Julie. Thank you. And thank you to the entire yes, thank you. So, Jerry, you're coming in on November 3rd, right. and Tommy Keys and all of them will be there yep. on the all presentation. Nine of, all nine of us, too, right? Yep. All, yep. all the usual suspects. Yep. Um, yeah, Mary's going to run the machine for you. That'd be great. Yes, I think she did a wonderful job on that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> 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 it is on Gazette, huh? It's on Gazette. Gordy, did, Gordy was, uh, and by the way, the Daily Hampshire Gazette paid for Gordy's way, and he was there the entire trip. Wow. You know, never saw him, said, well, geez, what the heck did they pay him to take pictures for? But he was behind the scene. I mean, that, that picture was Richie Neal. Yeah. He was on his, I'm not lying, he was on his back doing this trying to get Richie Neal here, all the people here, and the Capitol building in the back. And Gordy's not that young anymore. That, I'm not kidding you. He was on his back on the pavement trying to get everybody, because I, you know, saw him. But Gordy did a great job. The Gazette did a great job for why they did it. I'm not sure, but, you know. Hmm. Gordy's still pretty sure. Right? Great, great pictures. Well, it'd be great that yeah, if you could very possibly picture. notify the people that went on the trip from Northampton that at City Council, this will be shown. Normandy, huh? Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it was strict. I think they all need and to break. And we jump them all in. <laughs> 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 well, thank you. Uh, no green thing. Hey, I'm Mike Bubbles. Yes. Thank you. I didn't have Jerry, we've done great. Yes, thank you. Outstanding. Our stepped up uh, little ceremony in Leeds, I guess, uh, next to Memorial Day will kind of look like an order compared to this. <laughs> Talk about that. Oh, okay. Good. They had one. We went to it last year. We had well, lead ceremony. Lead ceremony. Right. Not on a break. Yeah, no. Lead right. ceremony we do the day before Memorial. We do it on the Sunday before yeah. Memorial Day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we're going to step that up a little bit this year. Good. A little more advertisement. Um, Good. Uh, yeah, just more. Veterans, right? Just more. What's that? You do with veterans? Yeah, veterans. Uh, no, uh, Memorial Day. Memorial Day. Day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, we do it the day before. Uh, the, the Sunday's good. Yeah, Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Works out good. We had a few kids, uh, we had a lot of people show up last year. Yeah, it was a, everything considered, it was one of the better turnouts we've had. Yep. And, and it was informational to a lot of people. It was. It was educational, excuse me, mm -hmm. educational to a lot of people. Yeah. So, we'll thank do it you. again. Thank you, thank you. Hey, thanks, guys. Thank, thank you very much. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I want to just talk about the new business for the month of November. We have the Board of Health, Ben Wood, coming in, giving us a basic and yearly update on all activities, department activities, and the Board of Health actions. And at 5.45 p.m., um, I have the President of the Human Rights Commission, Carol Reinhardt, um, coming in to talk about their commission what they are doing for the city of Northampton. And I just got an email from her the other day in regards to sending me some information. Okay. So, can I ask that? Move to adjourn. Should we open public comment? Yeah. Lachlan, go ahead. Got Before nothing for you today, guys. Yeah.